Good afternoon. Today, Sons of Norway welcomes award-winning author and filmmaker George Toombs to talk about his film, The Blinding Sea. Welcome, George. Thank you very much, Jenna. A little bit about George Toombs' background. As a journalist, he reported from six continents before serving as executive director of a medical association and then university professor. He has a PhD in history from McGill University. The Blinding Sea is his first film. Thank you for joining me to talk about your film, George. It's a pleasure, thank you. Over the arc of your career, you've worn so many hats. What made you decide to take the plunge and quit your job to make this film? Well, if you look at the different things that I've done during my career, it might seem to be a grab bag of all kinds of different things as I shift from one activity to another. But actually, deep down, there is one common theme running through all this, through my doctorate in history at McGill, through running a medical research association, being a journalist, uh, being a university professor, and that is the quest for knowledge. But as life has moved along, I have become increasingly interested in the wilderness. And um, the problem with the wilderness is it's very hard to represent just in words or in photographs. And I wanted to do a film about the wilderness. And this means getting out of your armchair, leaving the comfort of home and hearth, um, leaving a comfortable environment like Montreal, where I you know, have a, a large open air market just down the street and I can get any food that I need and I can get warm clothing in winter and going to really extreme environments to find out what people live like in those environments. In making The Blinding Sea, I wanted to make a film about an exceptional person, the Norwegian polar explorer, Roald Amundsen, who's probably the greatest polar explorer of all time. He racked up so many firsts. For example, he was the first to get through the Northwest Passage between Greenland and Alaska over the northern uh, part of Canada. Uh, that took him three years to do. And he was the first to the South Pole. He was also the second to lead an expedition through the Northeast Passage north of Siberia from Norway to Alaska. And also the first confirmed to lead an expedition to the North Pole. So he really was going out there and doing all these great things. He was a person who was a man made for the wilderness. And in a way, the wilderness was his university. It was the place where he learned life lessons, where he learned about uh, techniques of survival. He applied Norwegian knowledge of skiing and glacier trekking and, and sailing, and also learned a lot along the way. And for me to make a film about him, um, I wanted to be sure to get out of the armchair mode to go to some of the wildest places on the planet, whether the Southern Ocean, the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, parts of Alaska way up on Bering Strait, the Beaufort Sea, north of the Yukon and the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, which is the whole Northern Territory, including the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, and Norway, which has a lot of wilderness areas. Um, this meant getting out of my armchair, but it's also a film where I don't just present the point of view of experts. I didn't go looking for academic authorities the way you would if you were writing a work of scholarship, like, well, this person has you know, three PhDs and three master's degrees, and therefore they know what they're talking about. No, I went to very different kind of people. Um, I met up with members of the Amundsen family, got to know them very well. We had a wonderful experience together as I was making the film. I got to know Inuit very well in Northern Canada, descendants of um, a woman in particular who had proposed marriage to Amundsen back in 1904, and who all proudly remember this family connection. Um, and also uh, a Chukchi woman, the Chukchi are uh, a tribe or nation in Northeastern Siberia. And this particular woman was the daughter of a young woman that Amundsen actually legally adopted when she was a girl. So I tracked down people with a direct connection to the story, but whose involvement in the story is not 
the armchair involvement. There are people who are actually doing things. So I show Johan Amundsen chopping wood using an axe that Roald Amundsen had given to his grandfather. And, uh, you know, Inuit hunting and uh, also uh, dog sledding and, and throat singing, doing, doing things. So it's, it's a very active physical kind of film against the most incredible backdrops of polar scenery, whether glaciers, storms, uh, aurora borealis, or what have you. Wonderful. So how was your experience interviewing and getting to know the members of Amundsen's um, direct family descendants? I was very lucky to find them because I uh, got their contact information actually from a researcher at Cambridge University in the United Kingdom. And um, I didn't really know how to reach them. And I had this crazy idea that I would like to go to Norway just to interview them. You have to realize that when I started making the film, I didn't start doing a film about Roald Amundsen. I started the film backwards. I came to him backwards. That is, um, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation sent me onto a Canadian research icebreaker to do a radio documentary, a one-hour documentary, up in the Beaufort Sea over the winter. It was extremely cold, believe me. Um, at least I thought it was cold until I got to a super cold environment a little later, but I'll tell you about that in a few moments. And then I was on the icebreaker and I was, you know, we were caught in the ice, which was between, uh, I guess, uh, five and maybe 20 feet thick. Um, we were up there with a whole team of researchers from 10 different countries around the world doing scientific research. It was very interesting. But I said to the commander, would you please let me ashore to um, to get the Inuit side of the story? Because after all, the Inuit are the Aboriginal, pe Aboriginal people of you know, the Canadian Arctic, and they've been living there for thousands of years, and they know a lot as well, although their knowledge is not exactly in the scientific mode. It's more of folk wisdom or uh, ancestral knowledge. Um, and she said, no, as a woman, she said, no, you can't go on shore. It's too complicated. I can't afford to, to, to fly you by helicopter. It's far too risky and too expensive just for you to do a bunch of interviews with Inuit, and who knows, you know, whether you'll be able to get back to the ship or not. And I said, well, that's a good point. So I went back later to complete the radio documentary and I started hearing Inuit stories up in uh, Victoria Island, uh, which is not far from the place that uh, Amundsen had uh, uh, dropped anchor for a few years, Joe Haven on King William Island. And I began hearing these wonderful stories about Amundsen's close friendship with Inuit. I found this so starkly different from everything that I had learned about uh, explorers before that, uh, who were sometimes very exploitative uh, in different ways, who took all the resources of the Inuit or treated them as second rung people who were mere auxiliaries, guides and so forth. And Amundsen had a friendship on an equal basis, uh, sharing his Norwegian knowledge with Inuit and they would share back their Inuit knowledge with this Norwegian and his crew. So when I got to realizing that I, a story was kind of forming um, about Amundsen, I had to go to Norway and get to know members of the Amundsen family there. And because it's my first film, I made some technical mistakes during the first few interviews. The lighting was wrong. I sort of forgot to turn on the right microphone and things like that. I, ha I had quite the learning curve with the film. And uh, so I went back and I got the ultimate interviews eventually. And by which time I'd become really, really good friends and my wife as well with the Amundsen's who came to visit us in Canada and we've gone back to visit them in Norway. So it's been a very, very interesting experience. I think for the Amundsen family, seeing a Canadian making a film about their great uncle, a Norwegian, one of the two great heroes of northern uh, of modern Norway along with Fritz Jeff Nansen I found I think they found that rather surprising like what is he after exactly um, but then they realized that I had no real vested interest and I was not a dogmatic person I was just trying to figure out something that had somehow slipped out of sight that Amundsen owed a lot to his connection with the Inuit and he 
treated them with a lot of respect and he didn't have any plans to dominate them or to you know create a Norwegian colony in northern Canada nothing like that he was a wanderer in a way himself and the years that he spent living with the Inuit were probably the best years of his life the most fruitful the most trouble free and certainly for someone who had such a passion to find out knowledge it, they were a, just a tremendous experience for him. Great. And how much would you consider that his cross-cultural learnings um, contributed to the success of his trek to the South Pole? They made a huge difference. Um, I think we should think first of all of Roald Amundsen as a Scandinavian, as a Norwegian. So he's coming from a Nordic country with uh, part of the countries above the, the, the Arctic Circle, for example, the Lofoten Islands, uh, Tromsø, uh, different places in northern, you know, uh, 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 North Cape, places along the coast up in the north. And of course, there are the islands, the archipelago of Svalbard, which is sometimes called Spitsbergen still in English. Um, so he's from a Nordic country with a long, tradition of polar knowledge and strange to say in my research i contacted a lot of people in the university world and they said to me in norway and they said to me you know that the challenge is that a lot of this polar knowledge is unwritten so um you'd have to go back through sagas to find references to scurvy and how to deal with scurvy and different remedies that they had um, and skiing itself has a tradition going back thousands of years and maybe even 5,000 years in Norway. There are some rock paintings showing people skiing. But at the time Amundsen was um, exploring, skiing was relatively unknown in other parts of the world outside of Scandinavia. So he came with a tradition of often unwritten knowledge about the polar regions and an instinct because he did a lot of skiing in Norway and glacier trekking before heading to northern Canada. But then when he went to uh, Nunavut, as we call it now, the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, um, he spent this time as a kind of apprenticeship. Unlike other polar explorers, he didn't take claim for inventing in Inuit knowledge on his own. He always showed his admiration for the Inuit uh, his appreciation for their incredible survival against all odds in an extremely cold and difficult polar environment and the knowledge base that they'd built up. And this knowledge base included the right foods. So they had traditional but non-scientific knowledge of nutrition. Um, it included understanding of how to build igloos and how to get proper lodging during storms and during hunting expeditions. And he certainly benefited from that. How to run dog teams uh, with the tremendous husky dogs. I'll say initially one thing this film has done very positively for me is I had a kind of dog phobia. And when I did so many scenes with Huskies, I just fell in love with them. They're the most intelligent, the most amazing, energetic, enthusiastic, almost hyper animals that, I, that I've ever seen. It's sort of like you're spending your whole time with thoroughbreds that could go, you know, win the, the triple crown or something. They're the most amazing athletes. And I just was all over them and they were all over me and we were hugging each other all the time, I, especially the puppies, honestly. But he learned from Inuit how to, to do that as well. Now, there are people who say, well, no, Amundsen didn't, wasn't taught anything by the Inuit. Uh, no, they didn't teach him anything. I heard one very senior, well-known Norwegian scholar tell me that in a, in a real blast of a telephone call. He called me to sort of try to set me on a different course with the film because he knew what I was doing. He said, you can't say that the Inuit taught him anything. No, he observed them and he learned from them. Well, no, that's not what the record says. His own diaries, which uh, by the way, were published recently in English and in a translation, 
uh, his diaries, not the published works, but the diaries, the original diaries, say, well, Terayu, the uh, one of the Inuit, he continues teasing me and joking with me about how to build a proper igloo. And I built my 50th igloo. And he, you know, inspected it and said, do this and do that and do this and that. Same with dog sledding. He learned the art of dog sledding from someone, uh, from several people. One was called Talunato, uh, a man, and it was uh, Uglik, um, who taught him a lot about that as well. So he learned. He, he learned lessons, he, he treated it as an apprenticeship. And of course, women also, as vectors of knowledge in every society in the world, had a lot to teach him. For example, he wanted to build up a collection of the best Inuit fur clothing. And this collection eventually went to uh, uh, the University of Oslo, where it was uh, a tremendous resource, um, uh, ethnographic resource, it's a tremendous collection, which shows that he's very interested in science as well. And he, but he paid um, Inuit women to make clothing for him and he watched them do it. But he's also very cunning because he said, well, now that you've finished making this clothing, I mean, he learned enough of their language, Inuktitut, uh, and they learned enough Norwegian that they could all communicate together, which is also uh, to his credit. Um, he said, now that you've made this clothing for me, I want you to give me what you are wearing right now, and I'll give you what you just made for me, because I want to be sure that I really have the best quality, and I know you're going to keep the best quality clothing on your back. It's amazing. And so he got, he, he got the best clothing, and he wore it. And he realized that fur, the way the Inuit do, uh, where uh, fur allows your body to breathe underneath, it keeps you very warm, and uh, you don't collect humidity underneath or condensation. So he learned many, many lessons from them. He brought skis with him as well, and he gave them lessons in skiing. I don't think there's any record of how well they did, because it's sort of hard as an adult to start learning to ski. But the Inuit are very physical people, very well coordinated and used to the environment, and they know ice and snow. That's one thing for sure. So they must have found it really interesting to ski. Now in Norwegian, it is said there's no bad weather, there's only bad clothing. So how did you go about preparing to film in adverse weather conditions? And what did you do to adapt along the way? Well, I had a, this is another example of a learning curve that I had particularly uh, uh, up in the Canadian Arctic archipelago, which is like that whole region of hundreds of islands, big islands north of uh, the mainland uh, up in the Arctic. Um, I, I experienced what I would call nasty weather. Uh, for example, during a gale while sailing from Argentina to Antarctica on a tall ship. Uh, you know, a gale is not fun. It's very hard to film in because you keep getting salt drops on your lens and people keep throwing up at you and things like that because of seasickness. I don't get seasickness, fortunately. Um, and you can get moments of vertigo as the ship is tossing this way and that on the high seas. But really the weather in the Arctic, the Canadian Arctic in particular, I found uh, really difficult. And um, when I got to Joe Haven, which is named after uh, Amundsen's small herring catch, a small polar ship, the Yua, which is called, generally we pronounce it the Joe in English, so Joe Haven is where the Joe dropped anchor for a few years. When I got there, I realized that even with my best, warmest parka that was suitable for Montreal or maybe for, you know, Minneapolis or something. Uh, no, this, when I moved, it was so cold that it sounded as if my parka was made of thick paper. It was kind of making a crumpling noise. I don't know if the physical properties of, of synthetic material in a parka, like the outer shell, uh, change. Uh, someone would have to do a study about that, but I was really, really cold. And when the um, local constable of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police 
uh, or the Mounties found out that I was heading out on the tundra and the ice with uh, Palakwalek, one of the uh, grandsons of this woman, Kulia, could uh, propose marriage to Amazon. Well, he said, there's no way that I'm going to let you do that. I have responsibility to for a lot of things that go on here, and I'm just not going to let you out with your ridiculous clothing. No, it's totally unsuited. I mean, what if the snowmobile breaks down and you're, you know, 50 miles from here? You will die. So um, I'm going to rent to you. He actually rented to me uh, a full set of Inuit clothing, which was uh, like caribou uh, fur, parka, and sealskin boots, and uh, maybe um, husky dog uh, pants. I'm not too sure whether it was wolf or, or huskies, but um, I was really warm. The problem is when you're making a film, you have to adjust lenses. You can't just go on auto autofocus. If you're on autofocus and a little tiny piece of like snow, like half of a snowflake or a drop of salt water ends up on the lens, it's going to throw your lens focus off completely. So I had to do manual adjustments of my lenses naturally. But well, hold on a second. The wind chill on the coldest day that I had was actually minus 90 Fahrenheit. That is, for people in Canada, minus 68.3 Celsius. I have never, ever experienced cold like that before. No. The effect on me is one thing. The effect on my uh, my companion, George Kanana, the great-grandson of Kuliok, the woman who proposed marriage to Amazon, like they're all from the same clan, the people I was hanging out with, he was running dog teams back and forth. And the Inuit, it turns out, have developed over thousands of years a genetic tolerance for cold. This was proven by a recent study in Greenland among the Greenland Inuit, who are basically the same people as the Canadian Inuit or the Alaskan Inupiaq, uh, Inupiat. But they have a, to a tolerance for cold, which I personally don't have. So when I took my gloves off to adjust the lenses on my cameras, my fingers froze. And I was just like, K -k 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 -k. I, I, I had never experienced such cold. And you don't have like, it's not like you have five minutes to play with your lenses and get the right focus with a moving target, a dog team and Husky is very rambunctious going this way and that and the lighting and all the rest of it. You have maybe 30 seconds. My fingers became like chopsticks and I couldn't bend my fingers for three weeks afterwards. And my doctor back in Montreal, he had a look at me. He said, if you ever do this again, you're gonna lose all your fingers if you get frostbite again, they will just drop off. So don't do that. So I had to make adjustments. I had to figure it out. That day, it was so cold with this wind chill of minus 90 Fahrenheit or minus 68.3 Celsius. Well, the person I was with, George Kanana, said to me, oh, it seems you're having problems with your camera. I said, yeah, there's a plasma screen on it. There's a, no, I wasn't talking like that. I was talking like this. There's a plasma screen on it and the plasma is freezing and it's just like, it's, it's like going into slow motion and the camera is about to die. He said, no problem. Why don't you put it underneath your parka and keep it, you know, warm with your body heat? I'm not blaming him for anything that happened after that, but actually this was the wrong thing to do. It was a good idea, but it was the wrong thing to do with a, with a high definition camera and condensation b immediately built up on the camera because of my body heat and a little bit of moisture from my body underneath the parka. So when I brought the camera out again afterwards, everything froze inside and outside. And I had the idea before going on for the shoot that day, take your high definition camera with cassettes, like many digital video cassettes, because chances are, you know, if there's a problem, at least you can get the cassette out of the camera and keep that and hopefully thaw it out. And fortunately, I find that's one of the best scenes in the film. I was able to save the cassettes, but no, I didn't save the camera. The camera froze up and just died, and that was it. I mean, so I had, to, I had to learn how to deal with intense cold. Uh, what turned out to be the hairiest weather situation that you got into while filming? Well, I when you see the film, you know, some people say 
when you're doing a documentary, the rule is you shoot 10 hours of footage for every one hour that you use. And I didn't actually respect that rule. I bended the rule because in my own way, uh, I'm a kind of perfectionist. I wanted to get the story. I wanted to get the best lighting. I wanted to have very authentic relationships with people, uh, relationships built on trust. Because if they don't trust you, it shows in the, you know, in in the, it, it would show in the film, like if they were scared of me or suspicious of my motives or whatever. So I kept going and I probably had 200 hours of footage for every hour. So maybe altogether, I'm, I'm not too good at math offhand, but I had a lot. So some things that I did worked and other things did not work out. Uh, for example, uh, I was caught in a blizzard which lasted three days. Um, I've had blizzards in Montreal, actually. Um, one of the worst storms in Montreal I've seen dumped about um, two and a half feet of snow on the city, maybe three feet of snow. It was a huge storm. Uh, thank God that day I was supposed to do my oral exams for my doctorate in history at McGill and I wasn't ready, I crammed all night and I was like, thank you God for this, this snowstorm which closed down the university that day and I was able to go back to the books and study. But it, when you're making a film and you know you have your return flight supposedly booked on an airplane and you have a blizzard for three days, well, lucky I brought along a pack of cards to play solitaire because that was, that was extreme but I couldn't do anything outside. The weather we had on the icebreaker was very cold. One of the funniest experiences I had, again, it was not successful in terms of filmmaking. The commander woke me up and, you know, by telephone in the cabin that I was in on the icebreaker and said, look, there's perfect conditions for Aurora Borealis, you know, the Northern Lights, please come up immediately to the bridge and I'll tell you what to do. Well, it was midnight. I was groggy, half asleep. I brought my cameras up with a tripod and rushed up. And then there's kind of a, a deck right above the bridge. And I tried filming it, but again, it was so cold. I couldn't do anything with my hands. Uh, I don't know. I didn't ever try to figure out what the wind chill was, but the air temperature was well below minus 40, minus 45 Fahrenheit or Celsius, it's the same. A very funny experience happened, it's not extreme weather, but I was filming a scene with um, Johan Amundsen, the, the, the great nephew of Roald Amundsen, up in the Hardanger Vidde, where he has a lovely cottage up in the mountains. And uh, there was a beautiful alpine lake up there. And I just found it, I used footage from this from the scene that I was shooting in the film. But I had an ultra light tripod and, you know, with a camera that cost about two thousand dollars with all kinds of lenses on it. <laughs> and a gust of wind came up and I wasn't thinking I was just like so. Wrapped up with the, the scene that I was shooting, I hadn't thought like, oh, gust of wind, ultra light tripod. No, no, don't do that. You're going to lose your Nikon. And it plunged my camera into the lake and I had to dive fully dressed into the lake to retrieve the camera. I was lucky because I was fast enough that I got it out and there was no moisture or any problem within the camera. I could clean off the lens, cleaned off the lens and continued filming fortunately, but a lot of funny things happened along the way, I must say. Wow. Um, as a Canadian, how would you say your take on Amundsen and his explorations um, might be different from someone who's from Norway or the UK? That's a very interesting question because Roald Amundsen is a national hero in Norway. We all know that. The problem when you have a national hero is it seems to me people are either going to be saying, yes, he's a national hero, or because they're in a culture of a national hero, they're going to show that they're critical and independent and therefore they're going to say no he wasn't a national hero he was a fool or he was this or he was that um, and they'll be looking for things to uh, dismiss some of his achievements or to suggest that his motives were not all that great or he was very bad at managing relationships with people or whatever um, i'm not suggesting that he was some kind of a saint who was perfect in every way. I believe that his contribution 
uh, and it comes out very much in the film, a good understanding of Aboriginal people and a lot of respect for them. And he liked to share knowledge and he knew how to base his own decisions on a really solid evidence base. Um, so I was showing something different. In the United Kingdom, there's a whole legend around Scott of the Antarctic, and he's a tragic hero in the history of British polar exploration and the British Empire, because he was, after all, going to Antarctica to lay claim to the entire continent for the British Empire. That was his plan. Um, there's a tendency in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom, to downplay his mistakes and to uh, suggest somehow that Amundsen pulled a fast one on him by not laying out his plans in public very openly and lacking transparency. He was somehow not sporting. Well, this is sort of suggesting that polar exploration should be uh, undertaken according to a rule book written by so-called gentlemen in the British class system. Uh, and actually, life is not like that. And Roald Amundsen was from a seafaring family, a ship-owning family, and a commercial mindset where, you know, don't be that forthcoming about your plans, and you don't owe anyone any explanations in advance about what you were doing. And, well, Amundsen didn't always do with the funds he raised what he said he would. I mean, if, for example, he raised funds to go to the North Pole by sea, which would have probably been impossible. He took the funds and he went to the South Pole instead. So there are those two traditions, the Norwegian and the British. And, of course, when the British are saying that Scott is a tragic hero and somehow Amundsen pulled a fast one, they're also saying something quite negative about Amundsen, which I believe is unfounded. I, as a Canadian, came to the story without a vested interest. Canada is also a Nordic country in its own way. It's a huge country uh, with three million square miles of territory, much of it subarctic or Arctic, that is 10 million square kilometers. Um, it's also a polar country. And, you know, living through winters year after year, you hear stories about people who go out in the wilderness and are totally unprepared even in summer, there are stories of people deciding to go climb a, a peak in the Rocky Mountains wearing a T-shirt and sneakers. I mean, and then they get stranded and they nearly die of exposure. And then a whole crew has to come to rescue them by helicopter and, you know, at the risk of their own lives. We're, we know that the cold and the snow and ice are to be treated with the uh, respect. And it was here. I would just like to take a moment to, to explain that the Inuit as a as an Aboriginal people, they've often been treated as colorful, as eccentric, living at the ends of the earth, as funny because they use humor a lot to explain things and to communicate with people. Uh, especially when they don't, you know, have a mutual language. And, but they've often been left out of the story of polar exploration altogether. These very people who could travel hundreds of miles, uh, why have they never been considered polar explorers in their own right? If you consider that some of the folk tales among the Inuit, for example, the legends, the mythology of Kiviuk, the great shaman hero, are told all the way from northeastern Siberia and Alaska across the north part of Canada to Greenland. This is a huge territory. How come people tell the same story? Doesn't it mean that they also traveled a great deal in their own right by kayak or by dog team or both? Um, so. Uh, the Inuit were often left out of the story of polar exploration. And as a Canadian, I can see that what he experienced, Amundsen, living among the Inuit was really fundamental. And so that's one of the messages of my film, if you like, that he developed a friendship with them, a relationship which they still cherish to this day, by the way. That's great that you included um, more of a global picture in your film. Now, 
if the um, drawback of Scott's trick boiled down to having a lack of calories and an overage of crew members, uh, why did Amundsen's team end up succeeding, considering that they made the rash decision to head south rather than north on their expedition? Well, uh, Amundsen and Scott had very different leadership styles. And in terms of management in the world today, people would say that Amundsen had shared leadership and they would say Scott had authoritarian leadership or autocratic leadership. That is, Amundsen handpicked the best experts he could find who were the equivalent of gold medal winning skiers at the Winter Olympics these days or people with, and people with tremendous scientific knowledge of the polar regions and actual hands-on experience proven over many years. He would find these people, he recruited them, he worked with them. But then once the expedition got going, those people had responsibility for their individual domain of expertise. And Emerson had the last word on decisions, it's true, but he consulted people. Scott had a very different style. He wanted, he was a, an officer from the Royal Navy from a time when Britannia ruled the waves, had the greatest navy in the world, bar none, and the British Empire was an empire on which the sun never set. He didn't want to hire Canadians or Newfoundlanders for his expedition, that is people with Nordic experience, because he wanted people of the same culture as himself. He also wanted people who probably would be malleable, who would not challenge his authority or lack of knowledge because he was hired without any prior experience of the polar regions the first time during the discovery expedition. And he didn't really learn from his experience the second time during the Terra Nova expedition when he finally got to the South Pole. The people he hired were sometimes uh, scientists with you know, a lot of knowledge uh, of geology and uh, snow and ice, but they were not by and large polar experts like Amundsen's crew. Some of them were gentlemen adventurers who were not only in not good physical condition, but they were also people who paid their way. They paid like a thousand pounds per person, which might be you know, in the tens of thousands or maybe $100,000 to date, they paid for their part of the expedition just to do something cool or heroic. Well, it was really cool. Um, some of them died. Um, but then that's in the leadership style and how you choose your, your, your crew members. Um, there's a whole other side of things, which is that thanks to Amundsen's experience as a Norwegian and as uh, someone who lived among the Inuit, he had a very good understanding of food, of nutrition, of um, lodging, of uh, the cold, the problems of frostbite, hypothermia, how to avoid that, uh, and uh, dog teams, of course. Um, Scott didn't have this knowledge. And Scott was living at a time when the British Empire was the world's great superpower. That's true. But he, he was also a little bit ambivalent about what the Britons were becoming, the people of Great Britain, because he felt they were going soft because of the Industrial Revolution, which had provided all this prosperity. So he wanted to do things the hard way, and he deliberately chose the hardest way to travel. He chose that way, walking on foot and dragging uh, or man-hauling uh, the sled behind him. The, a crew of four would all go heave-ho and climb over ice hummocks together as they walked with sort of the equivalent of ice crampons that they had at the time. This is the hardest way to travel. Um, his men, by and large, didn't know how to ski. He knew how to ski, but not well enough to travel long distances, uh, you know, all the way to the South Pole. Uh, they brought skis, but they tended not to use them. They brought dogs, but sent them back because they couldn't figure out dogs. That wasn't something they felt they had to learn before going. They felt somehow that they would just muddle through and 
no people in the world were as resilient and resourceful as the British. Somehow they just figure it out. Well, if they went without really proper preparations, with a poor understanding of food, poor understanding of clothing, um, a poor understanding of the physical effort required by man hauling, uh, you know, you have to have a diet that corresponds to the physical effort. Um, so unfortunately, uh, Scott and the last crew members that got to the South Pole with him, they suffered from hypothermia, from gangrene, from um, frostbite. They also suffered from scurvy, uh, the beginnings of scurvy. They suffered most importantly from starvation. I'll give you an example. Um, the the uh, expedition surgeon, Edward Atkinson, who was a, a medical doctor, wrote after the Scots' disappearance in Antarctica that, um, and once Atkinson and a few others had found the frozen remains of Scott and his last crew members, he wrote that the physical effort that they were doing, man hauling, would require something like the upper 7,000s and low 8,000s of calories per day, like say 8,000 calories per day of food. And the physical effort that, that they, uh, that was a requirement, but they were only eating between 4,400 and 4,800 calories per day. So basically they were starving for a five month period. And this is something that people are, I, I understand why, but many people in, in the United Kingdom are very ambivalent about really coming out with it and saying, well, yes, they starve to death. Um, the problem with that is also that the food that they had, even though they didn't have enough food, the food they had had been processed in a way that removed almost all nutritional value. So they weren't getting what we now know are vitamins. They weren't getting protein and you know, as much as they could have. Um, they didn't have the proper balance of nutrition either. It's kind of the makings of a, of a disaster uh, to, when you look at the, the nutritional side of things. And I, when I was making the film, I did a lot of research. I did so much research. Uh, I, I, I studied um, a famous uh, research study done by the University of Minnesota in 1944, 1945 on the effects of starvation. It, uh, the University of Minnesota recruited 36 volunteers who f willingly uh, underwent starvation or near starvation for 13 months. And it gives us an idea when you read that study, it gives an idea of what Scott and his last crew members experienced. Um, and these are very, very difficult things to say because it's tragic. It is very distressing to see that people suffered from lack of motivation very much weakened immune systems, disorientation, hallucinations, um, uh, occasional flashes of anger, um, all the things that we could associate with um, starvation. Amundsen, on the other hand, uh, gained weight and his crew members gained weight because they ate well and abundantly, even though they were also doing 9,000 calories of exercise per day to give you an idea of how much exercise they got, the Norwegians were doing the equivalent of three marathons per day. So they were skiing, they were leading the dog teams alongside and working with dogs is not easy. So this kept them busy and they reached a height of about 10,000 feet or 3000 meters offhand uh, when they got to the South Pole. I mean, they, it was the greatest skiing adventure probably in the history of the planet up to that time. Uh, but they ate well, they, they studied it, they figured it out. Amundsen even brought along some cloud berries. Um, cloud berries or molten are well known in Norway and in Canada and Newfoundland and parts of northern Canada as a source of, as we now know, vitamin C. Vitamin C hadn't been identified yet, that came later in the 1930s, but people knew that it was very good for you to eat cloud berries. So much so, that in olden times, like a thousand years ago, when Viking ships were plying the waters of the Mediterranean Sea, they brought barrels of cloudberries on board to keep healthy, to have fresh fruit 
And this is reported by the great Norwegian botanist Knut Fagri in his work Norges Planter, which came out in the 1950s. I have a copy of it at home. So he was drawing on ancient knowledge as well as Inuit knowledge. Now, when you now, began when this began undertaking, this undertaking did you have did a you story, have a story or in mind in advance? Uh, or did you go into the whole project just to see what developed as you went along? I wish I could say to you that I had a plan and I went from A to B to C. I, I you know, I, I would like to say it would have been far more relaxing for me to do that and much less stressful. I started off being sent on to this icebreaker. By the way, the icebreaker is called the Amundsen. And right off the bat, I was very intrigued that a Canadian research icebreaker should be named after Norwegian. I found that very intriguing. But anyway, I wandered around the ship for the three weeks I was on board during the winter there in the Beaufort Sea. And I began to think, you know, they had a framed portrait of Amundsen on the wall on the way up to the bridge. And I was just like, who was this person? I mean, I've heard of him. I might even read a book by him. I don't remember. What's this story all about? And then when I got to hearing the Inuit stories, I was like, this is taking me away from my journalistic mode of going and interviewing experts. And I've done altogether probably 15,000 interviews, one five, 15,000 for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC, National Public Radio, uh, Minnesota Public Radio, uh, newspapers, magazines all over the world. Um, and I've been on TV a lot, and TV is really in the expert mode. They're looking for experts. I was getting in contact with real people. So I noticed that my plan or lack of plan was forcing me to find stories as told by real people. And I branched out, and then I went to Norway, uh, got to know the Amundsens. I went back to redo the interviews because I'd made some... Uh, technical flubs and I had to redo the interviews, but it helped me get to know them better. And then I said, well, there's a part of the story which is missing. So wouldn't it be good if I could find out if there's any descendants of Robert Falcon Scott, Amundsen's great rival from England. And I found Falcon Scott living in Scotland, who's the grandson of uh, the Antarctic explorer. And he agreed to an interview. And then I found the granddaughter of Sir Ernest Shackleton, another Antarctic explorer, Alexandra Shackleton in Ireland. And then I found uh, Julian Evans, the grandson of Teddy Evans, who was Scott's second in command, who fortunately survived the Antarctic expedition. And I found a baron in Belgium, Baron Bernard de Gerlache, who is the grandson of Adrien de Gerlache, who was the person leading the expedition the first time Amundsen got to the polar regions that was on the Belgica 1897, 1899. All of these people had tremendous stories to tell. So I was collecting, if you can picture this, interview material I found sensational. And then I was beginning to develop music for it with a jazz band in Montreal and I'm a musician and my wife sings so beautifully in the film as well. And I recorded Inuit throat singing, which is an extraordinary art form. I had all these different bits and pieces. And then in the summer of 2019, I experienced what I could only call a, a creative crisis. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do with all this material? How could I possibly bring it all together into a coherent story? How can I do that? I fell asleep. I'm sleeping. I, I should tell you that for reasons unknown, I often solve problems when I'm sleeping. It's not just that I wake up and I feel okay, I feel good and everything's okay. No, I actually work through problems while I'm asleep. In my dream, Alfred Hitchcock comes to visit me, you know, with his, he's very rotund, he's rather short with, he's much more balding even than I am. And he comes to me in the dream and he says, George, I said, Alfred Hitchcock, what are you doing here? Oh, I know you're having trouble with your film, and I thought I'd come and give you a hand. I'm very good at that, you know. 
I said, well, what could you possibly do to help me with a film? He said, you have tremendous material, George. My boy, you have all this material, interviews and nature scenes and scenes you shot at sea. How did you do all of these things which you can't pull it together? Well, I said, yeah, but what are you going to do for me? He said, well, I can co-direct. I'm very good at that, you know. You can put me in the credits or not as you see fit, but I'm going to help you pull this off. So I said, well, what's missing in the story? He said, you have all the material, but you're not telling people what they want to know. The, the, the viewers, the people sitting there watching your film, they want to feel the emotions of Amundsen as he gets to the South Pole. They want to know love and uh, anger, fear, you know, the, the, the imminent approach of death and hatred and jealousy and desire, all these things. That was the long dream. It was. Sometimes we were told by the authorities that dreams are very, very, very short, like 15 seconds. And then when you wake up, you're trying to make sense of it and you just make up the story to accompany with unconsciously. No, I took notes when I woke up. I had a cup of coffee and I was just like, what happened? How could I have had such a dream? And then I wrote long detailed notes. He told me to do this. He told me to do that and this and that and this and that. And that's the film that I finished finally. I finished it July 1st this year, uh, working with a very, very good video editor, uh, Guillaume Falardeau, and a very good sound engineer, Julien Bouchard, who really helped me pull it all together. So maybe years of watching Hitchcock movies over and over and over and over again, maybe that was my apprenticeship, maybe. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> It's a kind of crazy story, but you know, this is a work of history. In a way, you could say it's a work of scholarship because I stand by everything factually that I say in the film. But there are also scenes of paranoia and, you know, delusions of grandeur and fear and anxiety and longing for, you know, female companionship back uh, in Europe for all these polar explorers who are kind of marooned in the, Ar in the Arctic or the Antarctic. I mean, all those things, but somehow uh, driving through to the, the, the experience, how to represent the experience of a man like Amundsen, which is so different from our everyday experiences that we go about our lives. I found this a real challenge and this is the film that I've wanted to offer to you. Now, in the past few weeks, you've received multiple awards from different film festivals, I hear. Um, now that you've completed this epic production, what's next on the docket? I was very honored to win top awards in two festivals. One is the Toronto Independent Film Festival and the other is the Montreal Independent Film Festival. I was also blown away because this is my first film and I, I never to be truthful, I never expected to win awards so quickly. I mean, I finished the film July 1st and already in mid-September, I had won two, uh, three top awards. Um, and there may be more to come because I've submitted it to other festivals, including festivals in Norway, in Svalbard, in Tromsø and in Oslo. We'll see. But to win three awards already is, for me, was uh, it was a, a tremendous um, pat on the back, like, the years that you spent taking these risks, the physical suffering, getting a concussion, uh, having severe frostbite, uh, you know, being lonely at times when I was living through a three day blizzard, um, some of the surprises that I had, uh, running away from musk oxen and hiding behind a, a big rock. Fortunately, there was a big rock that day. It was, uh, it, it came as a lovely, gift really from the juries that are all made of film critics right now i have to market the film and things are going really well there's building interest all over the place for the film i'm very honored that the sons of norway uh, would like to share this film with your members and i hope that the members really get a kick out of it uh, they'll certainly get a breath of fresh air if not freezing air from the film um, and they don't even have to get seasick. Uh, they can just look at the film. But I wanted to offer something that gives people a direct understanding of the subject and maybe some insight into human relations. I'm planning 
uh, for 2021 to bring out a full-blown biography of Amundsen, which will be in print. It will be in print and also uh, as an ebook. And it will come to about 476 pages, as far as I know, with 150 black and white illustrations, beautiful photographs, uh, many of which I've taken myself and other photographs are archival. Um, I'd like to do another film in the Arctic, to tell you the truth, but I want to make sure that I market this film properly uh, and, you know, uh, distribute it in all the possible networks and institutions that I can. I'll get to the television networks eventually. Uh, I'm not in a hurry to do that because um, I have other things to do first. Uh, and maybe eventually onto commercial streaming like Netflix or Amazon. We'll see about that. That comes later. My wife says to me, and she's very, very wise, she says to me, don't go back to the Arctic in the winter. So if I make another Arctic film, I'll go in the summer. But in the summer, that's the time of year when all the birds are nesting, when the, uh, you know, there's a lot of wildlife to film. And, you know, it's more like a fishing expedition. You could fish for char, Arctic char, one of the finest fish, fishes in the world, uh, something like salmon. Um, and you can go berry picking. It's a very different environment from the winter environment. So I may follow her advice and I hope to invite her to join me for some of the filmmaking. Well, I'd like to thank you for sharing your experiences with our members, and I wish you all the success in your continued film run. Thank you very much, Janet. It's really been a pleasure, and I'm so happy to be able to share this film with the members of the Sons of Norway. Somehow I feel like people with Norwegian heritage, they have an inside you know, angle to, to, to appreciate uh, the wilderness, uh, the love of the wilderness, the love of nature, and also um, an interest in finding out something of what Roald Amundsen found out in his day, a truly great personality. Thanks so much, George, and take care. Okay, you take care too. Bye for now. Bye-bye.